chunk down, big rocks and decision gates. So those are just some of the phrases that the Prime Minister used in his press conference yesterday. His corporate lingo, it's starting to flourish, isn't it? As is his corporate approach to running the country, which saw nine public sector targets announced to begin fixing the country or marching the show forward, as he said. They're in health, they're in law and order, schooling, welfare and climate change. But are they too ambitious or maybe not ambitious enough, as I've just explained? Joining us now is the Prime Minister himself, Christopher Luxon. Thank you very much for your time this morning, Prime Minister. Um, you, th this kind of goes with your whole theme that you want to do more with less. So how do you expect hospitals and police and teachers to do a whole lot more with a whole lot less? Well, let's just zoom back. What we've always said is we want to focus on outcomes. These are the nine big targets that matter most to New Zealanders and it will help improve their daily lives. So that's really why we've framed these up. There's, of course, lots of other things the government will continue to do, but these are the nine big things that actually care, that New Zealanders care about. What we're saying is, look, what we've seen in the previous government is an 84% increase in spending, 16,000 more bureaucrats, and all of these indicators got worse. And so what we're doing is focusing the public service, we're focusing the government, and we're also being very clear with New Zealanders Zealanders about the things that they should hold us ultimately accountable for uh, to making sure that we deliver for them. Uh, that still didn't answer my question though, you're going to have fewer people um, delivering goals that weren't achieved in the previous government, so you're going to have fewer people trying to achieve way more than they did previously, so isn't it destined to go backwards? No, I disagree completely. What we had missing in the previous government was any targets or direction. And so you had a lot of the public service and a lot of the government running around what, asking what they were actually supposed to be there doing. Uh, what we're making sure is all the resources are prioritised and focused around delivering these goals. So things that aren't delivering these goals, we might as well stop. Uh, things that programmes that aren't working, we will stop. Wasteful inefficiency, back office and lots of management layers, we'll stop. Contractors and consultants will stop. But we're going to focus and get a better result out of the resources that we've got and drive towards these nine big targets. So, so what are some examples of programs and stuff that need to stop? Are you just talking about like working groups and, and people doing rainbow training or Te Māori courses? Is that the kind of stuff that you're talking about that you'll stop? Well, look, we have some really good examples where we actually have uh, great community organisations that are doing fantastic work, say, with young people and mental health, right? Uh, we will have other organisations that actually aren't quite getting those same results. So where we see good programmes, you know, uh, think about... Uh, I think about a lot of community programs that I see across the country that are actually getting fantastic results. They actually need more money, they need to be scaled up, they need to be able to deliver uh, those results on a much larger scale. We're going to do that. Uh, a good example for me would have been what we did before Christmas. You know, we, we know that we've got a target here about reducing the number of, uh, the, getting people faster treatment through emergency departments. One of the problems with that, and the point of these big targets, is they actually you know, drive uh, the plans and the actions to actually make sure that we deliver them, is that actually young kids under the age two are not being immunised sufficiently and so they end up in the emergency departments and so what we've said is let's partner with Māori, uh, they've got some great health organisations across the country that can drive immunisation rates particularly with Māori our kids up across the country as we can with other organisations and community organisations to do that task too. So there are programmes that are working well that we've got to make sure that we get good funding to that are getting good results for every dollar we give them, they generate four or five dollars worth of social benefit but there are other programmes frankly that just are costing a huge amount of money that actually aren't delivering the outcomes. Yeah, and, so and that's what I'm getting at. I mean, I, I know what you're saying say. and what you think is working. I want to know which of the programs that aren't working. What, what, what are the ones that you're cutting uh, to then reprioritise? Well, well, we've, well, yeah, well, we've tasked each and every CEO of every government agency to go through their budget and say, are there dumb programs that actually we've been committed to for a long time that frankly are not working or delivering outcomes and results for people? Is there inefficiency? Is there a huge amount of reliance on consultants? Uh, let's get the back office uh, uh, savings in place so that we can actually put that money into frontline services and protecting and prioritising those services. So, you know, that's up for each individual CE to work. Uh, no, they know their business. The minister's working with those CEs need to look at those programs and say, are they working or are they not working? Uh, but importantly, there's been a lot of wasteful spending. You, you know that. I mean, the public know that. There's been an 84% increase in spending. There's been 16,000 more public servants hired, and yet results have been worse. And so by focusing the system around these nine big targets, uh, you end up having other uh, conversations about the plans and actions you need to put in place to actually deliver these targets. I mean, you say that I know what the wasteful spending is, or that there has been wasteful spending, and I assume that there has 
has been waste, wasteful spending, but I just want to know what that wasteful spending is. So you, you're telling me that the programs that you're saying there's, that, that aren't delivering and stuff that you want to cut, you don't know what they are yet. You're, well, you're well, asking the CEs to find out what they are. So you don't know that they exist yet. Well, well, I'll just, well, I'll just say to you, across the whole of government, we have a huge government spending program. That has gone up 84% in six years. There is a lot of wasteful spending that's been going on across government. Yes, but CEOs what is that wasteful spending working, is what I'm getting at. Sure, and I'm, I've tried to tell you, we've got uh, back office functions, we've got massive duplication of people doing stuff, we've got programs that aren't working, we may even have roles that people don't think are actually you know, adding to delivering those targets or those goals that we have. Those are decisions that the ministers and the CEOs are working through in preparation for the budget. We've got a savings exercise up and running. But why do we want that? We want those savings to be generated from the back office so that we can put them into the front office. As I said last week, we don't want more spin doctors in a communications department in health, we actually want more doctors at the front line. And so by able to making savings there, we can actually make sure those funds are delivered to where they need to get to, to the front line, to deliver against these nine big goals. Yeah, and I think most people would probably agree with you. More, more front office stuff, um, absolutely. Let's talk about one of the ones, the, the, the 1,100 persistent young criminals, you want to reduce it down to 900. That's still not as low as it was in 2021 and 2022. Why didn't you make something a bit, little bit more ambitious, maybe make it 20 or 25 instead of 15? Well, what I'd say is we know we've had a major explosion in youth offending, and there's a lot of things that we're doing here across the whole of government to suppress youth offending. So there's, there's a bunch of things that are going on. What we're doing here is we're saying there are 1,100 young people that are persistent offenders, and actually we need to be able to work with them. Now, at the moment, that number continues to rise and is continuing to grow. We need to actually stop that growth. We need to stabilise it. We need to be able to bring it down. I've actually sat with these young people, 14, 15, 16-year-olds, working with social workers in different community organisations that some of them are doing amazing work with these young people but it is hard work because they're coming from backgrounds and from family environments often that actually are making life really difficult and, that, and the choices ahead of them and getting onto a better pathway isn't clear and that takes time for them to understand that so you know I'm just I'm, I'm acknowledging that yet yeah, we've got lots of work on youth, youth offending and how we suppress that whether it's about getting our kids back into school which we'll talk more about today uh, you know there's a whole bunch of things that we need to be able to do youth, youth serious offender category uh, our military academies, all of that good stuff. But actually what we've done here is identify the 1,100 uh, most challenged individuals uh, and we've got to be able to do the work one-on-one -on -one with them as a result. So, yeah, it'd be great if we make more progress, fantastic, but I'm just acknowledging it's hard work, it's been increasing, we've got to stabilise it and then we've got to be able to bring it down. OK, so I guess that's where it is, right? It's not like you can just stop it and decrease it. It's actually going to continue going up. You've got to turn the train around and then back it up. That's what you're that's getting exactly at. That's exactly right. We've, okay. we've, the, the, whole, the whole of us, in these nine areas, all the outcomes are going the wrong way. And so what we've got to do is stop, turn the big super tanker around, uh, and then actually get it heading in the right direction. And so um, all, all I'm doing here is setting, you know, six years is a good length of time. The New Zealand public can hold us accountable. Have we actually delivered on these things for them? Have we improved life for them? Them through these measures. Uh, and then what's important, you know, Lloyd, if I look at, say, for example, the job seeker target, right, we want 50,000 more people off job seeker. We know we've got a growing population. Uh, we know we'll have a whole bunch of challenges as we go forward in the next six years. But all of a sudden the conversation becomes, well, you know, in, in my conversations with those ministers and CEs, is what are the plans and actions you're taking to actually get people off welfare and into work? And there are some cases where it's really easy to get people from the job seeker into work because they're transitioning and we want to always have a safety net that supports them. But then we've got long-term unemployed that might have different needs, and that's a harder challenge. But we've got to make sure that we're working on those programs to get the long-term unemployed off welfare and into work as well. So, you know, that, that's the point, is that it will actually uh, provoke us to think about, well, how do we innovate differently? How do we try something different to get a different outcome? Because what we're doing hasn't been working. Things continue just to get worse, and we refuse to accept that. And that's why I keep saying we want to have more ambition. We want to turn the show around. And for that to happen, and we actually have to be able to try things differently. Um, can I ask you about Estonia? You mentioned Estonia yesterday as a country that we want to be like. Why Estonia? Why do you like that country? Well, well, all I'm saying is that, you know, I, I really have a vision by 2040, I want New Zealand to be one of the leading advanced small countries on earth. And for that to happen, I want us to be more prosperous economically, I want us to be doing better socially, and I want us to be delivering on our environmental goals and targets. Uh, when I look around the world at other 5 million people population or small countries, uh, advanced countries, you look at the work of Estonia, and they've done some fantastic work on bringing uh, digital services to their public services, a customer service mindset about how their government interfaces with their citizens. 
institutions. I look at Ireland and I look at what they do on research, development and innovation in science and technology. That's really interesting, as is their work on education. I look at what Singapore have done with respect to getting delivery out of their public service. Not dissimilar size to New Zealand. They have targets like I've just announced. So does New South Wales as a state uh, government as well. So, you know, I just look at other places to say part of the thing is that, you know, many countries around the world are wrestling with the same problems that we have here in New Zealand. If uh, we're, we're very successful, I think, at a lot of things, but where there's things that other countries uh, have done well in, we should just steal it uh, and make sure we bring that into New Zealand's thinking as well. Yeah, I guess the difference is, is that we're not a former Soviet um, republic, are we? Um, and we're not an emerging market. No, we're, we're a fully we developed market. we have lots of other market. advantages, don't we? Yeah, yeah. Well, we have I mean, lots of other advantages, but I'm just saying to you, across the, across the world, there are other small advanced economies. Um, if they've done things that work, uh, likewise, we've got great things happening within New Zealand that we actually want to see across the rest of the country, uh, and we've got to make sure that it gets everywhere. So, yeah, it, that's part of the challenge. We've set some ambitious goals. We want New Zealanders to focus on we are here to improve the country uh, by these targets, and as a result, we look at whatever's working around the world in New Zealand. We innovate. We try different things. We make sure that everything we're spending money on is delivering improved results and gets us closer to delivering those goals. Cool. Can I just talk to you about the Tahuia train? This is the passenger train that connects um, yeah. Auckland and Hamilton. It's just celebrated, I think, three days yep. ago its third birthday. Will your government keep it? Well, I've got to say I'm pretty sceptical about it. Uh, I was sceptical about it from the beginning. Why? Because public transport wins when it is more compelling as an option for, uh, for citizens to use than the alternative. And in this case, it's a slow train from Tahuia to Auckland. Um, it actually isn't quicker than probably going on the, on, the, on, on the road. And more importantly, it then becomes a white elephant. And I think when I last looked at it, it was about $90 per journey that actually the taxpayer is subsidising and underwriting that service. So in fairness, there's a report coming out, I think, at the end of June. Uh, we need to let that go through and see the analysis. It may have changed from my initial perception a year or so ago about that service, but let's see what the report says in June. I mean, I mean, just looking at the month of um, March, so last month 7,471 people used the train service. Um, just before Easter it was 600 people per day were on this train. That's, you know, that's what, I mean, 400 cars on the road. Uh, this is this is you know quite a lot of people off the road, and if you've been if you've been on State Highway One travelling south or travelling north during rush hour, you see the train hoon past you, and you go, they've got the right idea. So is it the right? Well, it might to, well to be. Get rid of this train. It might well be, Lloyd. But until we see the report at the end of June, all I was just saying was initially when this thing started up, uh, let's be clear, it was a bit of a white elephant. Uh, let's look at the numbers, see what is actually happening. Uh, let's look at what's happening uh, with its usage and with its cost as well. But you know, frankly, the taxpayers underwriting a service when I last looked at it some some time ago, granted, of about ninety dollars per journey. But let's see what the report says in June. Uh, very quickly, and I don't want a long-winded answer from this. Do you deserve a pay rise? Uh, again, those are decisions for an independent remuneration authority, and again, it's important prime ministers and MPs don't get aren't involved in setting their pay. Would you freeze it like Ardern did? Uh, again, yeah, we've got an independent remuneration authority. They need to go through a process. It's designed in a way so that you don't have a prime minister or an MP commenting on their own pay or setting their own pay. Let's see what the remuneration authority does. They're working through that now. Let's let them do their work. Okay, that sounds like a, a no to me. Um, thank you very much for your time this morning. That is Prime Minister Christopher Luxon.